Don't we'll get used to it. What did you say? Don't <laughs> we'll get used to it. <laughs> um, so I think we're ready, if you guys are. Um, are we ready? Yeah. How many council members do we have? Do we have a quorum? Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, so it's six o'clock, and I think that we are going to call this meeting to order. At this point in time, I'm going to call Mr. Heikes for the roll call. For the roll call, uh, Mayor De La Lisa. Here. Uh, Youth Council Members Hernandez. Here. Williams. Franklin. De La Isla. Here. McDonald. Here. Richardson. Sowers. Here. Scritchfield. Here. And District 3 is vacant. Thank you very much. At this point in time, we are going to go into the discussion items. The first item in the agenda is the introduction to the new members. Uh, prior to doing that introduction to the new members, I did want to, first of all, congratulate all of you in being selected to represent your city as part of the Youth Council. Furthermore, I wanted to give you all a basic uh, introduction to Robert's Rules of Order. We did this last time when we had our first group of, of new members join us. That way we all have an understanding on how the meetings are going to be run. This is the same way that we run the Robert's Rules of Order, uh, the meetings at the council level. So in order for you to be recognized because you want to make a comment about an issue, all you have to do is raise your hand as chair. I will call on you. Um, if there is an item that is an action item brought forth by the team, then what will happen is that one of the members raises their hand, they make a motion, and if the, if the terms of that motion are acceptable to more than one individual, somebody will then move forward to uh, making a second to that motion, which means that I agree with that. At that point in time, you will have a chance to do discussion yet again on that specific item. And then once you're done with the discussion, then we can actually go into voting and everybody will have a chance to vote. Those are things for when we have discussion items that are that are actually action items on your agenda. Um, uh, so at, at which point in time, anytime that you want to say something, you will raise your hand um, and we will make sure that you are able to communicate uh, not only with your team members, but you can make your comments and your remarks with regards to any item that is on the agenda. Um, you can also let me know if you're interested in talking to any of the individuals that are uh, presenting to you, at which point you, again, just raise your hand and let me know, and I will make sure that I call on you so that you can talk to whomever is actually presenting to you as well. Um, do you guys have any questions on this? No. Seeing no questions, just remember to raise your hand and somebody will make sure that I can call on you. We then start moving forward. For those of you who are new members, if you could please raise your hand so that we can start with the introductions. And if you could please share your name, um, your grade, and, uh, and how you got connected to the Youth Council. Okay, it's like District 9. My name is Ab sorry. My name's Abigail Scritchfield. I am a senior at Topeka High School. And I first got into all this. Um, actually, I used to work over the summer as an intern here for the probation court. And I'd have opportunities to walk over to the other side and be, I believe I was the defense attorney in the youth court. So I've had different chances to see everything. Wonderful. District 8. Um, my name's Harley Sowers. I'm a senior at Topeka West, and I first got involved was when um, I got, they came to my high school, and they started talking to us, and one of my teachers really wanted me to go out for it, so I did. Wonderful. Do we have District 6 or 7? District 6. I'm Sailor McDonald, and I will be a senior at Silver Lake High School. They also came to talk at, at my school, and I was one of three people there, so I really thought that I should represent my school. 
Okay. Sorry. Everybody. You're fine. I'm Sailor McDonald, and I will be a senior at Silver Lake High School. And my school also was um, approached by the Youth Commission, and they came in and talked to a few of us. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. District 5. Um, my name is Lauren Dela Isla. Uh, I will be a sophomore this year at Topeka High. And the way I got introduced was I came up to the mayor's office one day and Bryce was working and I was like, what's going on here? And uh, Bryce kind of explained TYC to me and then sent me the link. And then um, I accidentally filled out the government one, not knowing what I was filling out. Kind of got connected, but I don't mind. I really like it so far. So I'm enjoying myself. District 4. Um, hi, my name is Daniel Franklin. Um... I'm a, I'm a freshman at Highland Park High School. The way I got connected was, well, really, I had went to the, I had went to uh, the PDU, to PDU's commission meeting over here by where I live. And um, my mom told me about it. So basically, I just started getting interest, interested. And then we just went on from there. But, you know, yeah, basically, I just started getting interested. And then, you know, yeah. Thank you so much. District three is vacant. District two is is a uh, senior here uh, because she's been here from the beginning. But could you introduce yourself again? Hi, my name is Isabel Hernandez, and as you mentioned, I was here last year, and I was actually introduced to the group by Miss Hiller from District one. She talked to my school. I had um, met not met her before, but I had. Um, attended a camp through the help of her. So that's how I got introduced here. So we are extremely proud as the Pika City Council to have such an active and engaged youth council. Um, do we have any other members that we're missing? Okay, seeing no other members missing, we appreciate your commitment to being engaged. Um, today, I was watching your uh, town hall with regards to gun violence, and somebody made the comment that you are young and you don't have power. And I want to correct that statement because I truly believe that you all have power. And so is reflected by you being here today and taking stances on things that you believe in and providing direct input to the city manager, who is here as well, um, as well as community leaders that are here to be at your service, to engage in conversations with you so that we can continue making Topeka a city that you want to choose, live, and play for the rest of your life. Um, that being said, we're moving on to the second item on the discussion items, which is the 2020 pandemic. As many of you know, um, the city of Topeka and the whole world is struggling through the COVID-19 pandemic, which is a novel virus. Never we have, have we dealt with anything like this before. And it has helped us, it's put us in situations in which we are having to respond rapidly, strategically, and very aggressively to ensure the, the, the lack of spread of this virus in our community. To speak to us today, I want to invite to the podium Mr. Dusty Nichols. Mr. Nichols is the incident commander for the COVID-19 team. And his role, he will describe it a little bit in depth, and he will give you information on anything that you all want to learn. Mr. Nichols, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening. I am Dusty Nichols. I'm an incident commander for the COVID response in Shawnee County. Um, how this came about, I was the, uh, originally my job is the Director of Emergency Management for Shawnee County. When the COVID um, pandemics began to show up in Kansas uh, at Shawnee County, we have a resolution where we use the incident command system and the national incident management system. Within that, it defines that you have to have an incident commander, and that incident commander is specific to whatever kind of incident you're having. So if it's a fire, it's usually a fire person. If it's a um, hostage situation, it's probably law enforcement. This happens to be a public health <clears throat> issue. So at the time, the director of operations or the director of um, health department uh, Linda Oaks was the incident commander, and when it became too overwhelming for them to uh, handle all operations that, uh, that they were had going on over there with COVID and tracking patients and those kinds of things, um, I was asked to step up and be the incident commander, so I transferred my position to the health department. So I'm actually a health department employee right now, 
Um, and then when the uh, COVID goes back to manageable levels or the uh, disaster is um, under control, then I'll move back to emergency management. So that's how I came to where I'm at now. <clears throat> Once I got put in the incident command role, we started building a team, um, which we have uh, our incident command team, Molly uh, Hatfield is our PIO, uh, Richard Siegel from the fire department, Topeka Fire Department is our safety officer. Uh, the mayor is our liaison officer. So those are the, the command staff. Linda Oaks is in charge of operations. And uh, we have Pam, or excuse me, Aaron Mahan, who has actually stepped in for me as the emergency manager, is the planner, uh, emergency planner. Uh, Pam Northcutt and Scott Steele run logistics, and uh, Betty Griner is our finance officer. So uh, our, our charge is to track, maintain, um, and do anything we can to stop the slow and spread and mitigate pandemic uh, in Shawnee County through our partnerships, uh, which are widespread. Uh, we have a lot of partners in Shawnee County. And as we, uh, as we deal with the pandemic, now we're starting to reopen, so we mitigate and try to control the spread of what's going on in conjunction with the county health officer, Dr. Fazzino. So that is what our charge is right now and where we're in the middle of it, and I can stand for questions. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Mr. Nichols? Any at all? Typically, uh, Mr. Nichols, I do have a question. What are some of the things that you can tell our young individuals here present, um, how they can be a part of the solution with this COVID issue in our community? Because I think yeah. that a lot of people think that we're reopening and everything is okay. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, some people think it's a myth. Some people think it's fake. It is not. We do have deaths. There's, um, a lot of deaths throughout the nation. We have some deaths, and even in Shawnee County, we have we have nine as it stands right now from COVID. Um, we have a lot of cases, and the cases are starting to go up. We're I was just talking with the chief before we uh, started the night, and uh, we're seeing other counties around us, like Riley County. Um, we're seeing a spike in cases there from uh, from whatever reason. Uh, they believe I think it's from opening the bars and in um, some of those locations and. People ignoring the mass gathering and not wearing masks and protecting themselves. Uh, in our studies, as we're going through this, um, as we're going through this, we thought originally it would take two to four, excuse me, two to three weeks to see the effects of opening it up, opening up the community. Turns out it's up to six weeks. So what we're seeing now in our spiking cases could be from Memorial Day uh, all the way back from then. So as we open, we're trying to be very careful. Uh, the age groups of people getting infected um, are uh, most of those cases, I shouldn't say most. There's a large part um, that are young, um, between 18, 24, those kind of ages, that it doesn't, uh, the effects of the coronavirus isn't as bad on some of those, um, those age groups. Uh, we call the high risk people, uh, those of older uh, generation. Um, but the, the widespread part is the youth not wearing masks and protecting themselves and ignoring the group size and those kinds of things. So you really want to have an impact um, when we're doing the, um, the peaceful protests and all that that's gathering a lot of people. Please wear your mask. It, it will help. Uh, there's a lot of studies out. There's one I just read, a new one, uh, this past week where it was originally thought that the mask would help if I'm standing here it's equivalent to me covering my face if I'm coughing and it protects the person I'm with. Now there's some studies that show that it actually protects me as well, uh, especially if I'm not within six feet of somebody talking to them. So um, mask wear is huge and then keeping those group sizes down. Uh, make sure you're washing your hands on all those things. So, yes. What do you see for the future of Topeka? Uh, I think we're, we've got a lot of good things going. We just start the recovery task force with Greater Speaker Partnership, uh, reaching out with uh, a lot of partners with schools, uh, faith-based community. Uh, I work with a lot of groups all week long. We have standing meetings. And uh, I think as, as we go forward, we are being very careful, very deliberate. Um, and I think that's why our numbers are pretty low in Shawnee County across the board. We're doing pretty good. And I think it's because we're being very careful. And I think if we continue that, uh, I think we see recovery or, or a way to live with the virus until we can get a vaccine. Um, what 
what do you think school's going to look like as we're getting ready to go back to school? Uh, what do I think school's going to look like? I, I've been meeting with the school districts um, past eight to ten weeks, somewhere in there. I have a standing meeting with them. I do know at the state level, they're, they put a task force together. It's a rather large task force, um, a committee that's, that's trying to define how they're going to go back to school. Uh, that information is supposed to be released to the local level around July 10th that week. Once we get a hold of that, that'll kind of give us an idea of the restrictions from the state level as far as uh, the educators, how they're going to go about putting, uh, putting their schools back together, whether it's remotely or on site. I know from working with the uh, superintendents locally, they have a lot of hurdles to climb, uh, a lot of hurdles to jump over um, from getting people, to, getting people to school, whether school buses and then the different age groups and then changing classes and who's wearing masks and who isn't and then athletics. They have a lot of things they need to tackle. So uh, I think we'll get there. It may be something completely different than what we're used to. Uh, I know some of those people are really thinking outside the box, uh, and I think that's good. I think that's, that's what we're going to have to do if we're going to figure out how to continue on. So um, the, the short answer is I don't know, um, but I do know that we'll go forward. How many new cases do we have since phase three are we in? Uh, I don't have that number right off the top of my head. So I know that uh, we're spiking, and there's the dashboard. I don't know if uh, the mayor can share screen if she has that or not. Um, but that uh, absolutely, I will look for the. I think it, it's on the Shawnee County uh, Health Department page. If you go to the dashboard down at the bottom right-hand corner, and you can select the tab of that graph, and it'll uh, you can do points on that specific. Mm -hmm. sure. Um. The next question is. Uh, do we have everything we need to keep people safe? Right now, um, I would say we're green. If we're doing a scorecard, uh, red, yellow, green kind of uh, kind of grading system, I think we're in the green across the board right now. So that's why we have to be very, very careful because we did have a shortage um, uh, nationwide of some equipment when we first started. And uh, when we put the masks on and we did Safer at Home, that gave us a lot of cushion. Uh, to flatten the curve and get those uh, supplies bolstered, get the hospitals ready for um, patients. So we've we've got a lot of um, a lot of resources we didn't have when this first started, and I think that's uh, that's key to where we're going forward. So as long as we can uh, keep the rate of spread as where we're going right now, uh, as far as controlling it somewhat, uh, we'll be balanced out. We don't have a, a situation like Italy, Italy or or New York or anything, so those kind of situations that people are familiar with. We're, we're doing very slowly, very deliberately uh, because of those resources. That's key. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just fixed it, so I think you can screen share now. Thank you. <laughs> so here you see some of the graphics, and this is all public information for all of you who are here. We in our community, one of our biggest problems when we started this, and Mr. Nichols can, talk, Nichols can talk a little bit more about this, is that we at first didn't have enough testing, but recently we have been very fortunate that our hospitals and other places, not just KDHE, has access to testing. And KDHE is the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Um, in our whole community, we've had 509 total people reported to have a positive COVID test. And out of those 509, we have 412 that have recovered and nine people who have passed away to this virus, which leaves us 88 people that currently are having COVID at this time. Um, here is the chart that shows you how the cases are going up. And if you look at the graph, um, you start seeing that the blue line this is May 24th is more or less the, the, the earliest that we have. We had a significant spike right around June. Um, and you see that the numbers are going down, but they're starting to go up. Can you and click? Here, there you go. Never mind, you're good. Ready? Thank you. <laughs> there you go. The other thing that I think is important for all of you young leaders to notice is that when we look here at the cases, oh, by age was removed. Yes, if you scroll back up a little bit, oh, you must be uh, you must be updating it right now. Yeah, yeah probably. 
Uh, the KDHE, I think, has the breakdown as well. Um. Yeah, they don't have any data. But like Mr. Nichols was saying, most of the cases um, were younger people that were sick in our community. Any other questions for Mr. Nichols? So I know that right now with COVID and um, unemployment has spiked. What is like happening to help those people out? On uh, unemployment? Yes. Uh, there's there's lots of uh, data that's kind of flowing out there right now, uh, statewide and locally. Uh, I was actually looking at some of the unemployment data today. We are up um, from last year at this time, uh, but comparison to other counties, we're not doing too awfully bad. And I, I believe some of that is um, most of the workforce in Shawnee County, we have something in Shawnee County that no other county has, and that is the Capitol Building. So we have a lot of um, essential workers uh, at the Capitol and then uh, military bases and so forth. So I think that's part of the reason why our, uh, our essential workforce and our unemployment is not as high as it is in some other places. Um, but at the same time, it, it is going up, and I know that working with the Greater Topeka Partnership and uh, some things they're trying to do at the state, which I'm not real familiar with. Um, that's kind of out of my realm. I, I focus mainly on mitigation and trying to get businesses open. Uh, as far as the ag exact numbers, I, I do, do know what's going up, but I don't know exactly how far that's gone up. Other questions with regards to COVID? All right, well, thank you very much, Mr. Nichols, for yeah. presenting. Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you guys. Uh, really appreciate it, and wear your masks. Thanks. We now move on to the next item in the agenda, the rallies and the protests. Um, at this point in time, uh, Chief Cochran, if you're there, Um, if you would like to make a statement to start opening us up um, so that we can start talking about how we've been working with our youth to ensure that they are able to express themselves and, uh, and then so that we can start having an open conversation with regards to the Black Lives Matters movement, our support for it, and, and where we're at. Well, fortunately in Topeka, uh, well, first, thank you for having me. Uh, Mayor, thanks for the invite. And city manager, thank you. Um, I think one of the best things about the city of Topeka, we're in a much better position than a lot of other communities. And I think that has a lot to do with the amount of work that we have done uh, within the community over the last couple of years. And um, having those community partnerships, establish those relationships, uh, it's carried, through, carried us through uh, some turbulent times uh, or potentially turbulent times. So one of the things that we um, really take uh, into great consideration is when we have organizations that want to um, do uh, assemblies and peaceful assemblies and stuff like that, we reach out to them and we uh, see what we can provide to them, what resources uh, we can assist them with, and how we can keep everybody safe, and then how do we uh, um, make sure that the event uh, comes off uh, without a problem, and so every since every every day since June first, uh, we've been very fortunate in that aspect and those relationships. And what we've noticed uh, with this particular movement that's going on across the, I don't know about the country, but I, across the, our county is we have a lot of young people that really want to be involved, that really want to express themselves, and really want to um, express frustration and uh, express the need and the want for change. And so again, in our county, in our city, we're very fortunate because we work with those uh, young people that organize it as well as the uh, pastors and stuff like that that are helping them organize whatever event they'd like to have. And so it's been very successful. And one of the other things that I can say um, Almost all the changes that I have seen that people are wanting to see changed, we have already been doing those. Um, 
and had those practices in place for many, many years. And again, I think that probably uh, helps us as a community and where we're at. Thank you, Chief. Any questions or comments that the youth have for the Chief? I want to make sure that all of you know that as long as it's uh, shared in a respectful fashion, there is absolutely no comment or question that you can make that we would want to censor. This is a time for all of you to be able to express yourselves and to ask any question that you want. Um, so at this point in time, I see Mr. Franklin that wants to make a statement. Mr. Franklin. Uh, yes, um, so what has, what has speak, what is, what is, what is speak I already done? You know, for the um, for violence and gun violence and everything like that. What are like what are, what are the uh, police department, police station I already done to you know help prevent the issue and stop it? Uh, so, were you asked about gun violence or the current uh, protests or whatever? Um, gun violence, gun violence. Please. Yeah, gun violence. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. That's one that. Uh, we've been working very diligently on, and I'm extremely disappointed that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic hit us because uh, I'd been working with uh, Dr. Anderson at USC 501, and we'd come up with a plan that we were going to um, start meeting with the youth within our high schools and soliciting from them uh, what they see as part of the problem or solutions or what they're experiencing. Because one of the things that uh, so I told Dr. Anderson is, as adults, we're really good to tell young people what they need, uh, but very seldom do we sit down and listen um, from them and hear from them what they really need. And so that's what these round tables are really gonna be focusing on is sitting down and talking with young people, uh, getting their experiences, their feelings and stuff like that. And then what can we put into play or what actions can we take to um, make things better. And so we're all working on a project that uh, just got notified from Perf Police Executive Research Forum uh, just today. And we're coming up with a model template that is gonna be used uh, and published. It'll be a guideline for law enforcement agencies across the country on how to respond to um, non-lethal, which means nobody was killed, uh, shootings that take place. And so, <clears throat> That, that's going to be really exciting when that uh, gets published. But uh, we are focusing on this year was to focus on youth violence and the aspect of how can we prevent it and how do we get young people involved in uh, activities that are uh, positive in nature. Um, so when, when you look at the whole package, uh, we're including education. And by the education, we're talking about getting into the schools uh, I don't know if you're aware, but we have the, the TCOT program out at uh, um, by Hummer Sports Park. And we were in freshman classes this year at all the high schools. In August, we'll be in the freshman, sophomore, and then have TCOT. So we'll be reaching all four classes, all four grades within USD 501 schools. And this, these classes aren't um, to learn, you know, so much about the activities of the police department, they're geared towards education. How do we um, get the message out? How do we talk about uh, crime and stuff like that, as well as provide information on how investigations work and stuff like that? Because one of the things that we have to establish to be successful as a community is we have to have the community's trust in the police department. And so we feel, or I feel, uh, our mission is we have to reach young people. And we have to establish that. We have to make it to where you as a young person, you feel comfortable talking to the police department um, and also get the feeling that you don't have to worry about your safety and you don't have to worry about any ramifications or anything like that. So the partnership, uh, you know, like I said, if you look at what's going on with our local uh, rallies and gatherings, They've been facilitated by young people. And so I think to me, that's a message from the young people that, hey, we want to be involved. We want to uh, be part of the solution and we want to be part of the answer. And so I think we have to capitalize on that. Additional questions or comments for Chief? Chief, can I ask you a question? I think that 
our, our youth would like to know, um, could you talk a little bit with regards to, you've been extremely active uh, with regards to the Black Lives Matters movement. Can you talk a little bit about the things that we don't do? I think that a lot of our youth is very uh, interested in the eight can't wait uh, movement that people are hearing. And one of the things that I'm extremely proud of with our police department is that under your guidance and leadership, there's been a lot of things that we have changed. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I'm assuming everybody's uh, familiar with the uh, eight can't wait. Is everybody familiar with that? Well, I would Google it because it talks about eight things or eight platforms that um, in police reform that's being requested or whatever. And, you know, I'm proud to say that we already do all those things. But more importantly, it's part of the bigger thing. It's the, the zero campaign. So the eight can't wait is just one of the pillars of the zero campaign. And so you really need to Google that and do a little bit of research about what the, that is. And then you can see what the eight uh, can't wait. But um, a lot of those are uh, eight pillars of uh, police reform that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement would like to see. And like I said, we already do those and uh, um, at different levels. So uh, I was, I'm excited. One of the things that I can tell you is that um, when, when the Ferguson event took place, um, I was not uh, the chief or I was a commander, but I wasn't the chief. I wasn't in a position to make a lot of changes. But one of the things that I did is I started a lot of research about uh, things like that, and I researched that, and I researched the eight can't wait. And uh, if you want to read a, uh, it's a long document, but it's a very enlightening document. Is the uh, Department of Justice uh, report on Ferguson, and explains a lot of things in there that really uh, led to the scenario and situation that that they got into. Um, and so, one of the things is for us in law enforcement. And I stress this all the time with my commanders is you have to continually educate yourselves. You have to be aware of what's going on in the communities. You, but more importantly, you have to be aware of what's going on in other communities because the greatest thing about <laughs> the Internet and life, you can always look at somebody else's failures or problems or issues. And if you're not there yet, then you can prevent a lot of the things um, that take place in other communities. And so that's one of the things that I'm really excited about and one of the things that I stress with my commanders. It's just like right now I'm putting together a, uh, a, a education paper that I'll be sending them in the morning and it breaks down. One of the things uh, uh, right now there's a lot of uh, requests for police reform. And so the state of Colorado just passed a state reform bill. Uh, I think it's Senate Bill 217 in Colorado. Uh, but it outlines, and that one right now is getting a lot of um, attention from Kansas legislators. But, um, and it could be a template for us if there's not a police reform package that comes out of uh, the federal government. If the House of Representatives and, and, and the Senate don't have their reform bill done by January, uh, I think January 15th, I think, is when legislative session is supposed to come back. But if there's not a, a federal reform package in place, the Colorado Senate bill very easily could be a very um, formidable template for the state of Kansas. The best thing about that Senate bill that has basically six main points, we at the Peak Police Department already do all those things. And so we're very progressive. We're, we're very, uh, I say, ahead of the times. Uh, have a tremendous amount of support from the mayor, the city manager, and city council members, but we get that support because I think they realize uh, the quality of agency and the people that we have working for the Topeka Police Department and that we're always striving to get better. We don't. Um, one of the things I don't like that drives my staff nuts is uh, I, I don't like the status quo. I like change and I like making change happen, and that makes people uncomfortable, but if you do it enough and you do it accurately and you do it well and it's planned out, they start to get on board with that. And so I think that's kind of where we're at now with, with, uh, with the Topeka Police Department as a whole. And people understand you got to educate yourselves and the officers got to continually educate themselves. And, and so um, I feel pretty good about where we're at.
Chief, could you also talk a little bit about defunding the police, which is uh, making a higher focus on mental health awareness and training on mental health? Um, it, it, we've talked a lot about the fact that the, the, the slogan, defund the police, often sends a negative message with regards to there not being any police officers out in the community. But could you talk a little bit about CIT and, um, and the Vallejo staff person that, that even the city manager wanted to make sure that we did not remove, even through our, our budget crisis right now? Yeah, uh, defunding the police is one of those uh, slogans that catches a lot of attention right now. But uh, depending on who you talk to, it means a lot of different things. The educators and stuff like that, the stuff that I've been reading is, when you talk about defunding the police, you're really just talking about transferring funds from one entity to another entity to accomplish uh, basically the same thing, but in a different fashion. And maybe a fashion that is not a, a role for law enforcement. Because a lot of these things, as we have evolved in law enforcement over the years, there's a lot of things that we do that are not law enforcement related. They're more social work related. But one of the things that I realized that um, many years back was we were not servicing uh, our community that was in behavior health crises in a proper manner. So what would happen, you know, five, six years ago, an individual who was in a mental health crisis or maybe a substance abuse crisis would have an encounter with law enforcement. A lot of times they would end up going to jail when what they really need is services, whether it's uh, mental health services or substance abuse services. And so the CIT program that we, we evolved, that we evolved uh, focuses on decriminalizing that behavior. And so we are, uh, I'm very proud of where we're at again with the Peak Police Department. It's part of our basic academy. It's a 40-hour certification course. And then after that, you receive continuing education. But what we've done is our, uh, a huge majority of our agency is now all trained in that behavior health crisis training. And so we divert a lot of people away from the jail and we get them to behavioral health services. And so um, one of the things that uh, in this budget cycle, uh, you know, restructuring things, and this, this all started before the conversation of defunding police. But we have, uh, I made the conscious decision to put more funding over into behavioral health services and, and things like that. And so, so far, you know, the, uh, our budget proposal has been accepted by city manager and finance, and it'll be, it's going to the city council. Uh, I'm pretty confident that those dollars will stay there. Uh, but those dollars, uh, the allocation that I have made from our agency to that, and so we talk about defunding the police and transferring funds, we've already doing that. We're already doing that. We're ahead of the times. And again, we have done that out of necessity. When we look at things and say, okay, Community partners maybe don't have the funding. They don't have the ability to do this. How can we make them do that? How can we get them to be a partner? How can we engage them? And so, uh, you know, transferring of funds to behavioral health services and stuff like that is something that, that we're already doing. And like I said, um, it, it started long before uh, conversation of defunding the police. Again, I just think that speaks to the proactiveness of the city of Topeka uh, my vision, city manager realizes that vision, the mayor understands that vision, and so uh, when you have everybody on the same sheet of music, transferring those funds or moving those funds doesn't feel like you're being punished moving funds, you know what I'm saying? It's a partnership that we all enjoy because those funds on the behavioral health service side of things benefits my officers greatly because it gives them more resources, uh, it gives them trained personnel that they work with. And, you know, when you talk about behavioral health crisis, it, you see, I see all these things right now coming out in the news where, hey, we're starting this unit where we have these mental health professionals working with police officers, and now they're going to talk to people. We've been doing that for, for five years. It's just a matter of enhancing it and making it better and making it more efficient. Uh, so Right now, 20 budget, the 2020 budget is kind of tight and difficult because of the COVID thing. Uh, but I'm very excited to where the 2021 budget is headed and, and what we're going to be doing with that. And I think, uh, you know, City Council, when we have that opportunity to talk with them about some of those dollars and what they're being used for, uh, I think they're going to be excited and, and impressed as well. Okay, so I think I gave you guys enough fuel for you, you guys to really dig into questions. Uh, 
Councilwoman, uh, Com young council leader uh, De La Isla to be followed by Mr. Franklin. Um, so. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, my No way. Does Daniel go first? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what can the Topeka Youth Commission do to help you? Uh, what can this commission do to help us? I, I think there's a tremendous opportunity here for the police department to work with another uh, organization of young people that want to make a positive influence in the city of Topeka. And what's really great about this commission, it's made up of individuals from all across the city, uh, just like the city council. So what we need to do is we need to sit down and we need to have conversation and talk about what is the message that we want to put forward uh, that you guys and how you want to cooperate and how we want to uh, make a positive influence because the more young people that we have that understand the workings of not only government but of the police department and the services that we provide um, that serves as a benefit for current young people and future leaders of, of our of our city you know the, the mayor made the comment we want this to be a city where we want you to live grow up and raise your kids and and uh and, and work, and, and that's exactly, I, I think the city of Topeka is a great place. Uh, been around a lot of places. I know the mayor's been around, the city management around. And when you go to different communities and you see what they got going on, maybe they got, you know, prettier scenery or whatever, but when you talk about the fabric of the community and how it works together and uh, the partnerships are forged, you're not going to find one any better than the city of Topeka. I can tell you that right now. And so having you guys... Uh, working with us at the police department and city government to help get that positive message out there, the positive things going on. And uh, when, when bad things happen or negative things happen, we're able to sit down and we'll talk about them and we'll work them out and we we'll come up with positive solutions out of negative situations. Mr. Franklin. Uh, thank you. I have a question about uh, the Explorer program. How can this give the youth a better understanding of the law enforcement? How can they, you know, um, basically just inform them, inform them of like what's going on, you know, when it comes to police, when it comes to police station, and how you guys, how you guys do your work? Yeah, uh, the Explorer program. I'm glad you mentioned that. It's a tremendous program, and we have about 40 young people involved in that, and that's part of the reason that we wanted to get into the high schools because we wanted to be able to reach more young people. Uh, face to face with the law enforcement officers and see the role and that they're, that they're regular people and they have families and then try to get those uh, um, that desire to see what it's what it's all about uh, you know the explorer program then get information on on the, our website but we can also get you all kinds of information on that and when you join the explorers program uh, you go through an academy to learn a lot of the basic stuff you get to do Ride-alongs with police officers, you get to experience how to utilize use of force, how the use of force is uh, supposed to be utilized. You get legal aspects of all that stuff. Um, and then uh, once you graduate the academy, then like I said, you can do ride-alongs. And then when you come in, uh, they meet every Monday, I think it is. And when they meet, you get different trainings or situations or scenarios in education. Now, one of the best things I can say about that uh, program is that out of each, uh, every police academy we have over the last four or five years, we have had anywhere from one to four um, explorers in that program. My, my daughter's one of them. She's out on the streets now. Uh, but my other daughter was a police explorer, and uh, uh, we teach leadership skills in that as well, and I think that's one of the best things. And that daughter, she was either going to be a, a nun or she was going to be a police officer. And now she's an emergency room nurse, trauma nurse uh, at uh, Stormont Vale. And so the leadership skills that we teach in that are skills that will help you whatever you do. It doesn't mean whether you're in law enforcement or not. But we can get you that information. And I would strongly encourage um, maybe one of, the, one of your sessions, uh, Mayor, we could meet out at the armory. Uh, you could do their meeting. And then we could... Uh, get you guys into some of the scenario-based training. The Milo is a decision-making system. Years ago, we used to have the shoot, don't shoot scenarios. Well, the Milo scenario now gives the operator of the program the ability that uh, when you give the individual orders or commands, they can either comply with them or they can't comply. In the past, 
they couldn't control the system. So what it makes you do is go through de-escalation training and things like that. Uh, but if that's something that this council is interested in, uh, you can have the meeting out there at the Armory, at our training facility. We've got plenty of room. Um, and then after that, we can uh, get, you know, show you some of the things that we do and, and exercises like that. But I think that would benefit uh, you guys immensely because then that gives you another tool in your toolbox that uh, you can go back and talk to other young people about the Explore program. What does the police... Yes, uh, Councilwoman. Sorry. Um, what does the police want us to know as the youth about um, the Black Lives Matter situation? Like, what do you guys want us to know um, about it? What do I think what you're... Um, about the Black Lives Matter. What do the police want them to know about the Black Lives Yeah, as, as youth. So. Well, I think what uh, the Youth Council, and I guess the City of Topeka and everybody else needs to realize is uh, the Black Lives Matter... Um, organization here in town. We work very closely with them. Uh, they're, they're very professional and we have not had any issues out of, out of uh, any of the organiz any, of that, any of the rallies or get togethers that we've had from that organization. I think one of the things that has happened across the United States is the, the, the movement of making change has been hijacked by people that have uh, ill intent. And that's exactly what happened to us June 1st that Monday night. Because everything that we have done, uh, everything that's happened since then, we've been in communication with them. And so I think what the citizens of Topeka need to realize is uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement here in Topeka has been uh, very professional. Uh, we've not had any issues. They want to work with us. Uh, I even had some of them come down to me on Tuesday, the morning after, and say, how can we help business owners clean up and uh get the, the downtown back to where we need to be. And so I think that speaks volumes of, of their commitment to uh, wanting to make change in a positive manner. And we have to be very aware that with anything that goes on in communities, you have certain individuals that no matter how good something is or, or how, whatever, however, however good the idea is, somebody always wants to, to destroy it or wreck it. And so I think that's what, you know, we really need to stand. In the city of Topeka, we're very blessed, again, with the partnerships that we have, and those have been established over the work uh, over the last couple of years. If I could add a little something to, to those of you, because I, I love the fact that this group of young leaders is extremely diverse. I want you to hear from your mayor that Black Lives Matter. And the fact that we're saying that Black Lives Matter does not invalidate the fact that uh, Caucasian lives matter. It doesn't invalidate the fact that our police officers' lives matter. I think that you all need to hear that Black Lives Matter because it's an outcry that nationwide there has been over and over the death of Black men uh, that are happening all across our country. And in many cases, in many, many cases, to the hands of police officers that are not great, that are not willing to have the conversations that we're having right now. Um, and the fact that you have a chief that um, is willing to have this very difficult conversation and a group of people that are willing to say out loud, absolutely Black Lives Matter, period, um, is something that we need to keep building on. It's, it's, it's a moment for our communication to, to be often. It's a moment for us to invite other people who may not understand why we say what we say. Um, it's a time for us to, to make sure that we change the fact that we have a system that is inherently broken. Um, and it is in this table that you are all sitting in, whether you're here sitting right there in front of your chief, or whether you're like me and Mr. Franklin that are at, sitting at home still talking with the chief and with the city manager at the same time. These are the tables where changes happen. We, we used to not have, because uh, for those of you who are not familiar, I pulled it up. Um, so if you were watching me look at something on the side, um, and part of me because the birds are singing, the aid can't wait says that you ban chokeholds, that you require de-escalation, that you require warning before shooting, that you exhaust all alternatives before shooting, that you have a duty to intervene, that you ban shootings of moving vehicles, that you require use of force continuum, and that you require comprehensive uh, reporting. And all of those things would not be happening if we didn't have a situation in our community that put us in the place that we have to have these conversations, we have to continue doing better. And black lives do matter. 
Mr. Franklin, you were going to say a few words. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, what about precincts being financially penalized for abuse? Could you say that again? What about precincts being financially uh, penalized for abuse? Oh, officers being penalized for abuse? Is it, was that the question? Like, a, the, like the precinct being financially penalized for... Oh, oh, the precinct yeah. being financed. Well, uh, the city of Topeka, we only have one. <laughs> we have one law enforcement center. And uh, um, so when you talk about some of the larger cities, I think that gets to the point that the mayor was talking about. In some of those places, you do have systematic issues. You have systematic racism. You have systematic abuse and those uh, a lot of times happen when you have precincts in bigger cities because those precincts kind of become their, their own little city within the city shall you say uh, you know and so the oversight and the checks and balances aren't there to the level uh, that they are in some of the other places and I think when you talk about you know defunding uh, precincts or penalizing precincts that have that systematic um, type of behavior. I don't think the precinct itself uh, should bear the consequences. I think the command structure has to bear the consequences. Because if you allow certain things to take place uh, that you know are not right, but have been an accepted value or an accepted uh, um, action, over the years, because some of those officers that are in the command structure grew up in that precinct. They've been in that same area their, their entire lives. And so when you talk about the accountability and the transparency aspect of it, the commanders and the frontline supervisors have to be held accountable. And so when you, you, uh, you know, I don't know, when you talk about punishing the precincts, that can mean a lot of different things. It can be funding. Uh, it could be reduction in staff. It could be a lot of different things. But I think, you know, one of the things that uh, the federal government has to uh, get reinvolved in, uh, that, uh, you know, the Obama administration was very active in, is that when you have an agency that goes astray, somebody's got to step in and take that under control. And so, you know, under the Obama administration, there were a lot of judicial decrees, which means this law enforcement agency did something really bad. And so the federal government steps in and sends people in to help correct that action or get that agency back on track. Um, that has not been utilized uh, very much in the current administration. But when we talk about uh, reform the law enforcement I think that's an aspect that really has to be brought back because it's a very powerful tool, very powerful tool when the federal government comes in and says, this is not going to happen here, okay? But the federal government says that, Bill Cochran, you're not doing a good job as the chief. And what's going on in your agency is not acceptable by anybody and by any means. And because of that, we are now going to take over and we're going to run your agency. We're going to make decisions for the agency. Um, and I think that's a very powerful tool, but I think it's something that we, we as citizens um, have to demand. Um, the federal government can make changes, and the federal government carries a much bigger stick than the state government. And so when you talk about those things, punishing the precinct, a lot of things is, you, you know, police agencies and city government get a lot of money from the federal government. And so if you are misbehaving, if you're doing something that's not acceptable and you tell that police agency or that city government, you're not going to get federal dollars that you have to have to be successful because of these actions that are taking place. But if we come in and we help you and we outline it, we get to put it back on the right track. And when we talk about this, we're not talking about something that happens overnight. A lot of these Department of Justice, uh, the judicial decrees, they can last anywhere up to 10 years. Uh, New Orleans, um, they might have just came out from under theirs or they're getting ready to. And they were put under a judicial decree after Hurricane Katrina. 
because of the things that were going on in that law enforcement agency. So these aren't things that happen overnight. These are things, and a lot of those uh, changes or whatever that are brought in by the Department of Justice when they do that, uh, a lot of those are the pillars uh, of the, the zero campaign and the can't wait, uh, eight can't wait. Um, and so it's really, it's a tool I think that we really need to, as citizens of, of, of this country kind of demand of our Department of Justice. You know, if you're going to be a Department of Justice for the people of the country, everybody, then um, I think it's a tool that, that uh, because the only reason you get put under one of those uh, judicial decrees is you, you, you got a lot of bad things going on in that agency. Okay, we, I think District 1 had a question for Chief. How can youth or other people know about what you guys are doing? Like, how can we let them know? Or how are you guys, like, getting all this information out to the public? Yeah, that's one of the things. The city manager and I have had conversation about that. Um, and so one of the things that, unfortunately for me, the lot of things we do, we do because I think it's the right thing to do. And uh, accolades are not something I'm looking for. But... The, the downside of that is there's a lot of things that are going on that the public uh, would benefit from hearing. And so I think this, like I said, with this youth council, this is an opportunity that if we can give you guys more education and uh, explanation of things that are going on, then when you go back to your schools and you have conversations with other young people, uh, you can ex express some of those things. Um, but yeah, one of the things is, uh, is doing that. So I can tell you what we're going to do with our... Uh, SPCP, the Strengthening the Police Community Partnership that we have. Uh, right now we're doing uh, quarterly police zone summits. And so the one that's going to be coming up in the third quarter is going to be uh, kind of an education piece that talks about all of these different things that we're talking about right now. And then the fourth quarter one, we're going to focus on policies within the police department and give people an opportunity to, to uh, we'll put something out and say, hey, what four or five, six policies would you like to sit down and, and, and talk about? And just go over those and through those. And so the public, even though the, all of our, the policies are available online, uh, but as I was told by one person, you know, if I'm trying to find something, I'm not going to go online and look through 100 different policies that some of them are <laughs> 25 pages long and stuff like that. Uh, so we got to be able to get that information out to what our policies say and and uh, what's expected of the police department and our officers. So we're going to really work on it in the third quarter, of get, third quarter of getting that message out, and then the fourth quarter talk about policy. Thank you. Additional comments or questions for the chief? With regards to the protests, anything with regards to anything. I mean, seriously, guys, this is your time to just make sure, because remember, the expectation of this is not only will you provide additional feedback to the council and to the city manager, but this is also an opportunity for you to take all of this information that you're learning tonight and sharing it with people that you are surrounded with. Mr. Frank. Uh, yes, ma'am, I have a question. Um, so before you were um, talking about how you're going to earn the trust or get the trust of other African Americans when it comes to um, the police and calling the police and letting them know about an issue or anything that's going on. You know, it's really, I've really seen, like, I haven't really been on social media, but I would see how people, they would call the police, but then the police really, they really want to take action and do something to maybe protect the person, protect the African American, and keep that person in safety, or they would, they would do something to where it's really just pinned down on the African American, and they would go through the punishment, you know? even if they didn't do the crime. So it's like, I feel like it's hard for people to actually get the trust, or I feel like it's hard for people to actually trust the um, police department and the police because of what we've seen and what we hear about when it comes to the police and actually not feeling like they can be safe. They cannot, they can't be safe for you know, a lot of forces. Yeah, I think you raise a very valid point, and that's one of the things that uh, uh, I feel one of our mission is, is we need to be accessible to everybody. We need to make sure everybody feels safe. And so we're really trying to break that paradigm at the, at the police department. Uh, and uh, 
I think we're making headway, but it's still one of those things that um, people are reluctant, you know, for many different reasons to come forward. One thing that I would ask all of you as young people is don't judge the city of Topeka by things that you're seeing in other parts of the country because we are different here. Um, we, we, we do have issues. I'm not saying we don't, but uh, we really are working hard to establish that, that trust with young people, uh, establish that trust with the African-American community. Um, I don't know how many places um, across the country, but um, I communicate at least two or three times, if not more, uh, times a week uh, with uh, pastors throughout our community, and many of those are black pastors. And what I do is I, I give them information. If I see something that's uh, coming up or there's a situation that we're working, I will give them information uh, that I can give them. And the whole purpose for that is when people start coming to them or they start hearing things, they can say, no, nah, this is what's really taking place. And that's been very, very beneficial. And it's also opened up a lot of transparency. Uh, and I also do that with our governing body because in the past, they didn't get that kind of information. You know, they, they'd see it on the news or whatever. Um, but the other morning, I, I think I woke the city manager up at 6 o'clock, I think it was, or 5 o'clock. Uh, it was early. It was very early, you know. But it's part of that is um, if he's going to have to answer questions about what we're doing, he needs to have those answers, and he needs to have them before you get asked questions. And so uh, you raise a very valid point, and that would be one of the conversations that um, I'd like to sit down with you and uh, maybe a couple of your friends and say, okay, how can we get you to trust me more? You know what I'm saying? How do we uh, bridge that? How do we make that go forward? Um, because one of the things we know about the stuff in the past, we know about uh, systemic things and, and we know uh, about those, but there are things that we can change and we got to focus on the things that we can change. And having that... Uh, uh, conversation of, of how we go forward. We know what's happened in the past, like I said, but knowing what's happened in the past, what can we work on to make the future, the present and the future better? And, you know, those are conversations that we got to sit down and have. Uh, because I'm not in your shoes. I, I, I cannot give an explanation why, just like you gave me, why a young African-American male won't talk to the police department when they see something that happens in their neighborhood because we want neighborhoods to be safe. But there is underlying reasons there. We know that. There's history there. We know that. Uh, but how, how do we make it better? How, how can we get to where you can look me in the eye and I can look you in the eye and I go, I can trust you? Um, would you be willing to do a... <laughs> Would you be willing to do a, um event where you sit down and we have people from the city or around the city, such as youth or adults, whoever wants to come, and just, like, be totally vulnerable with us and let us ask you questions so that we gain a more trusting relationship with you and the department. Yeah. Would you be willing to do that with us? Yeah, I think that, yeah, you're, you're hitting on something that I actually I've been working on, and uh, the mayor's kind of aware of it. Uh, I'm trying to put together a, uh, a um, meeting and what it's going to be titled, entitled is, what's your expectations of the Topeka Police Department? Because we need to hear from citizens, you know, we maybe think we're doing something that everybody likes. But on, in reality, it may be something that nobody likes. Okay, if that's the case, then are we doing it just because we've done it for 150 years? Um, but, you know, really hearing some of those expectations, some of those things that uh, bother people. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, again, I think the fiber at Topeka is different. I honestly believe we can sit down with a, a large, uh, diverse group of individuals and have meaningful conversation. And uh, that, that's what we're focusing, and that's what I'm working on, trying to get set up. I wanted to do it next Tuesday, but finding the facility and stuff, and with the COVID stuff, we're still <laughs> working through that a little bit, so. Council, Councilperson Sowers also had a question. Oh, um, I didn't. I'm sorry. I just had my hand like this. Oh, okay. I was told that you raised your hand. Oh. 
All right, any other questions or comments for Chief? This is very healthy discussion. The only thing I'd like to say in parting is um, I, I really would encourage uh, you as a council to, to talk about it and figure out a date that you would like to have one of your meetings uh, out at our training facility. And, you know, you can do your regular meeting, and then after that, then we can roll into some of that, that stuff. I think you guys would get a lot out of the, uh, the Milo machine. Uh, also, the best thing about the Milo is, is if uh, you want to hunt zombies, we can also do that, too. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I want to hunt zombies in the Milo. <laughs> Yes, Councilwoman Sowers. Um, what would you like us as the youth, like you said, you wanted us to take things from here and um, tell the public and stuff. What would you like us as the youth to tell the public? What would you like the youth to tell the public? What would I like the youth to tell the public? Uh, sorry, I don't have my hearing aids in either. <laughs> uh, I think what I would like from the young people in our community uh, already we have seen them uh, starting to speak out, express their feelings. Um, but I think what the message I would like to see from the young people is that I think for the first time we are, I can I tell you, for us as a police department, we are actually listening to young people. And again, that's been one of my messages. That's one of the things that I've been working with Dr. Anderson at 501 about is, is how do we do that? How do we, because... Life's a lot different than when I was a kid, okay? Uh, you guys have a lot different pressures. You have social media. Uh, things are out there before, a lot of times before, we're, we're, we're still responding and it's already out there. Uh, so I think the message that I'd like to have put out is that um, young people are speaking up. Young people are, are um, being heard and listened to by the city government, by the police department and other officials. And that um, you guys actually uh, are helping formulate change and progress for the city of Topeka. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay, if there's no more questions for the Chief, I would like to invite to the podium Mr. Bryce Lipke, who is going to talk to us about something that the council that has been working before this one um, started wanting to move forward. Yeah, so I just want, sorry, what? I said welcome, Bryce. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you guys. Um, I know a lot of you are new members, and for those of you listening um, on the live stream, this might be a little bit of a new topic for you guys. So I just wanted to kind of intro, give you some background on where we're coming from with this next part of our meeting. So last year um, was the first year for the Youth Commission and then also the first year for the Top City Youth Council. And so they took on, they had four meetings last year, I believe. Um, they talked about mental health at one, they talked about gun violence, they talked about things to do in Topeka, and so it kind of all accumulated into um, how can we better suit youth in the community, especially when it comes to gun violence. And so um, last year's group was working with the mayor to draft some legislation that we can give to the city council here in Topeka to spark some conversation with them. Um, giving them more perspective of what the youth see, what we want to see happen in the future, um, because it is really important that the youth voice what they see because it's not necessarily the same as what adults see. Um, I think it was really interesting, me and the mayor have been to um, conferences with the uh, um, United States Conference of Mayors, and even last summer we were already talking about youth gun violence. That was one of the major topics of the meeting that we had when we went to LA. And so I think it's really cool to look back and see youth have already been talking about this issue for a while and we're starting to finally be heard, especially here in Topeka, um, where we have really amazing adults that are already willing to listen to us and we don't have to fight for that platform, just like you guys are here today. So that kind of all rolled into the legislation and we've been talking about it a little bit on our group chat um, for this new members. Um, something that we just want to finish up, um, kind of put a stamp on it if you want to say that, and present it to the city council here in Topeka. Do you guys have copies of it with you? Sweet. Um, so hopefully you've been able to read over that a little bit, but really tonight we were just looking to polish it up a little bit, um, make any last minute changes we need to, add anything, take anything out, and then have it ready so that we can give it to the city council at a later date. 
So Bryce, I think that it would be useful since the, the portion of the resolution is not long. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of explanation preceding it. Would you please uh, out loud, if you don't mind, read the resolution? Because I think that maybe what would be worthwhile is for the draft resolution to be presented tonight so that youth can make some comments and that way then we could potentially either have an off-site meeting and refine it or present it to the council so that the council knows that this is the sentiment of the youth council. Yeah. Um, so the resolution reads like this. So it says a resolution introduced by the Topeka Youth Commission for consideration by the city of Topeka City Council. Whereas Topeka, Kansas has seen an increase in violent crime and in turn gun violence. And whereas the United States Department of Justice, Justice's reform crime reporting statistics reports the violent crime rate in the city of Topeka is 580.6 crimes per 100,000 people well above the national average of 382.9 violent crimes for 100,000 people, and whereas the state of Kansas has no law requiring firearms dealers to initiate background checks prior to transferring a firearm, and firearm dealers must initiate the background check required by federal law by contacting the Federal Bureau of Investigation directly, and whereas the state of Kansas does not require unlicensed sellers to initiate a background check, when transferring a firearm, and whereas current United States federal law does not require dealers to conduct a background check of if a firearm purchaser prevents a state permit to purchase or process firearms that meet certain conditions, and whereas individuals can either conceal or carry or open carry without a permit, and whereas the state of Kansas has limited laws regulating the use of assault rifles, and whereas the lack of, lack of general education surrounding the proper gun usage Whereas the legislation would support increased background checks, which would ensure the guns are only accessible to those who can use them appropriately. And whereas the legislation would support the use of permits to, for conceal and carry permits for open carry. And whereas the legislation would support restricting access to assault rifles and whereas the legislation would support increased educational training for gun owners. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the governing body, City of Topeka, Kansas, introduce this legislation into consideration. At this point, um, the documents state that pretty much there is a requirement for the city of Topeka to adopt uh, such resolution. I think that the first step that we should take um, as your mayor to ensure that it is adequate for city purposes is uh, city manager, if you're okay with us submitting this language unless the council, the youth council wants to add something to legal so the legal could make a differentiation with regards to what is under city jurisdiction and what is under state jurisdiction so that the youth can then provide the resolution divided in pieces, one to the state and the other one to the governing body of the city of Topeka for the actions that they are requesting. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense. There are certain pieces of this legislation that I know will, will be covered by the state and that the city won't be able to enact. Um, that it's pro uh, we're prohibited from having uh, at, within our authority. So um, I think that makes sense. It's the right answer to understand exactly what we could do. Um, you know, it, it's it can end up being, in my opinion, if there's these are things that they support or want to support, that um, it could end up being a supporting uh, statement that we support these kinds of changes to state law and uh, move forward in that respect for the ones that we don't have authority for. That is wonderful because I think that the other idea that the prior youth council had was that once the city council uh, helps the students ensure that the language in the resolution is adequate, then the resolution would be shared not only with the state but with the federal representatives of the state of Kansas that are, are, that are representing them right now. Is that correct, Bryce? Yes. Okay, um, and, and just so that everybody is aware, one of the things that I'm extremely proud of is that once we have legal and all of you refine this resolution to include the language that you all so desire, it will also be shared with the U.S. Conference of Mayors so that other youth councils can make use of this resolution should they ch choose to use so. 
Any comments or questions for Bryce? Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so at this point in time, if the, if the council, the youth council would like to make a motion to pass this on to city legal uh, in order for our legal department to take a look at it and uh, work on the document so that we can divide it with regards to what is adequate for the city and what is adequate for the state so that then we end up with two resolutions that are going to be presented. Um, do we have a motion for that? I motion. So we have a motion by Council uh, Councilperson Sowers, and do we have a second? I second it. We have a second by Councilperson De La Isla. At this point in time, do we have additional discussion on this item? Seeing no further discussion, we proceed voting by roll call. Youth Council Hernandez. Um, Youth Council Hernandez? Yes. yes. Uh, Youth Council Franklin? Yes. Uh, De La Isla? Yes. McDonald? Yes. Sowers? Yes. Critchfield? Yes. Six voting yes, the motion passes. The motion carries. At this point in time, you guys, the new council has had their first motion, um, and um, your document will be passed on to the legal department to continue uh, being refined. At which point in time, once we have uh, certainty that the document is where it's at, the council members will be invited to come in front of the city council uh, to discuss the document that they're presenting. Um, are there any other items on the agenda or outside of the agenda that the council would like to talk about? Okay, seeing no other items, if there is nothing else to be said, this meeting is then adjourned. I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you to all of you. Congratulations on your first youth council meeting. I hope that you are all as excited as I am and um, that you all know the pride that I have inside of my heart to see all of you young people having some pretty crucial conversations that the rest of the community should be having. Um, so thank you very much, and we are adjourned.